best off last week, the last few Pesukim of Pe- Mishlei, the last two Pesukim, Tov Erech HaPayim Migibor Moshe Leberuchov Menochet Eir. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit is better than he who takes a city, he who conquers a city. That's the, the basic translation. Shlomo Melech is talking about the value of one who is able to control himself, his anger, one who is disciplined. As we will see, Bezat Hashem, throughout the Sefer of Mishle, there are many valuable lessons, ideas that he shares with us, many of them being from his experience. And, of course, the whole Sefer is being written, Beruach HaKodesh, so he has tremendous insight into human nature. And this is very valuable for us to learn. The earlier, the better, so we don't uh, make any mistakes that we, we regret. So, Erech HaPayim is a beautiful midah. It is a midah that is that describes HaKadosh Baruch Hu in dealing with human beings. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is very tolerant of us. We make many mistakes. We may, many times go against His wishes. Erech HaPayim is therefore a tremendous challenge. An individual who possesses this midah of Erech HaPayim, he is described as being very powerful, very strong. What's so special about being very strong? These are admir- admirable traits, not that which you find in the Guinness Book of World Records. Many of those records maybe are gifts from Shamaim. This is something that one accomplishes on his own. He is stronger than a loked ir, the one who conquers a city. One who conquers a city, has ma- he has a lot of help, outside help. He has many foot soldiers. So he has many forces to his assistance. One who is fighting against his nature, he's fighting against all the forces. He has no outside help. So there's a tremendous difference between one who controls his anger and one who is able to demonstrate a tremendous feat of conquering a city. After all, the bottom line in conquering a city, in winning a battle, is that that battle was won in a Shemaim. In a Shemaim, one received assistance to do battle against the city to win. When one does battle with his own nature, even though Kadosh Baruch Hu helps those who first help themselves, nevertheless, he did it on his own, through his own free will. There's no Shemaim really involved here in him going against his nature. When one goes to war, which side will win depends on what Akadosh Baruch Hu wants. So this is a very admirable trait, something that everyone needs to work on. To be tolerant, to be patient, to restrain oneself, to not get angry, even at times when there is a need to get angry. The anger should be perhaps shown on the outside, but inside one should not lose his control. That was the last pasuk of that chapter. Here he translates it that the lot, the lot is cast into the lap, but the decision is only from Hashem. Very interesting pasuk. A lot of people are envious, would like to have what somebody else has. They feel sorry if somebody grabbed the deal before them. He says, in the end, everything is cast in the lot. Everything is mina shamayim. Akol bidei shamayim, chutz mirat shamayim is a very important rule in Judaism. It takes a tremendous amount of bitachon, not emuna, not plain faith, but bitachon, reliance in Akadosh Baruch Hu, that we trust that He apportions every, everything in this world accordingly to wherever it needs to go. And whatever one receives, that's what Hashem wants him to have, not more, not less. And therefore, it would be silly to be envious to want that which someone else has. Because that was meant for him and not for us. And it's all in a goral. It's all part of the fate or destiny, as, it, as goral is really called. And if you want to test this out, just go to bingo games and guess who wins? All the prizes. It's always the rich. It's always the rich that win the cars. It's always the rich that get the million dollar thing. Because money goes to money. Because it's all part of a mazal. You won't see, very rarely, sometimes you see a, a lucky man, a poor man winning the lottery. That happens too. But for the most part, there's a mazal. And this mazal dictates who will win. And whoever has the better mazal will always win. So, why, why feel bad about it? It's going to go wherever it's meant to go. That's the simple meaning of the pasuk. Hashem kol mishpato, everything is mina shamayim. Nothing is by chance. Judaism does not believe that anything is by chance. Everything is preordained. Every, for everything there is a cheshbon, there is a reason. The word goral is something very interesting. It is also used to apply um, to a sit- situations where one does not know what to do. There are some very difficult decisions in life that one can make a goral, as certain rabbis have done in the past. 
and as it is done sometimes even today under certain situations to know what to do there's a way to do it to figure out what the Torah advises us to do and under certain situ- circumstances one can seek the help of Hashem to try to figure out what is the right thing to do and that is determined also through a Goral that was pretty much the last Pasuk in the chapter that we did last week and that we Goral is one's destiny, one's fate or it means the lot, to cast a lot okay now we're going to begin chapter 17 here you will see many concepts that are not necessarily related to each other some may sound familiar nevertheless they're very significant and we're going to do approximately half the chapter today it is better to have a dry piece of bread and have tranquility than a house full of sacrifices of strife of arguments, of fights. In other words, what good is all the luxuries and all the money that one has in a big mansion if every day he's fighting with his spouse, if every day there are fights amongst the kids, the siblings. You know, what kind of a home is that? What is all the, the luxuries worth? It is better to have pat a dry piece of bread, but tranquility, peace of mind. Shlomo Melech says, you know how important, how valuable it is to have peace of mind? A lot of people don't have peace of mind. They have money, but they don't have peace of mind. And whose fault is it? It's their fault as we're going to see why people destroy their tranquility. That's what he's going to talk about. How that tranquility is disrupted through people's own actions. I mean, life can be very, very difficult for some people who struggle. But even in the struggle, there could be a certain degree of peace of mind and tranquility. The Hebrew is called Shalvat nefesh. When a husband and wife are very close, really close, there is respect between the two of them. And they're not very demanding the very simple people, that is a recipe for success. When a person becomes demanding, that leads to, basically, that's, that, that's a form of selfishness. Because he demands, he wants something for himself. And when one is selfish, and the other one, you know, doesn't get what he wants, and he wants, and he insists on getting what he wants, you can see what this is going to breed. So it's better to live a simple life. No credit cards. If you can't afford it, don't buy it. But in this country, of course, they got you used to borrowing the money. If you don't have it, borrow it. You owe yourself a Lexus, the latest one. And don't worry about payments, $200 a month. You can lease it. But if you only make $60,000 a year, that's not the car you should be buying. You should be buying a used car, a 1999-2000, for four four $4,500. And it will work just fine. It will get you to work. But the problem is people have to make an impression. You know, in some circles, it either is a BMW or a Mercedes-Benz. Otherwise, you, you don't belong in the circle. You know, and that's, that's silly. Because these, these kind of things interfere with the tranquility of a person's life. How? Because if he doesn't have it, he's going to feel bad. He's going to feel miserable. Especially if his neighbor has it. A simple life, that is the recipe for tranquility. One of the ingredients of tranquility is to be not so demanding, to be willing... Anyway, so that's what he means by a dry piece of bread. You don't have to have steak, filet mignon, and all the good food. You can have even a, a simple Israeli salad with a little bit of hatzilim and, uh, and a piece of bread. And they have a very nice dinner. And you, if you want to be romantic, you can put some flowers or candles on the table. And it will be just as beautiful. Healthier. Yeah. What is that? And healthier. And healthier, sure. Yeah, that's, that's the idea over here. The Midrash says something very interesting. The Midrash says, you're better off living in Israel, even with less money, than living in Chutzlar, it's outside of Israel, with lots of money. But you're living in Israel. You know, in Israel, it's, it's hard, you know, to uh, live it up like people live it up over here. It's a little harder, you know. So the rabbis tell us, don't feel bad about it. You're in Eretz Israel should feel happy that you're at least there even if you don't have that much those people who are really living there are very fortunate they have a tremendous zechut merit to be living in Eretz HaKodesh so that is the words of the Midrash on this Pasuk better to have a little bit than be in the right place than to be outside of Israel and have all the luxuries in the world this Pasuk is somewhat connected to the next Pasuk because he's going to emphasize another important point and that is the many fights that occur when, it, when the inheritance is involved. When a, when a father and mother pass away, or one of the two or both, in many families there are fights about the inheritance. 
And that's even if things are written clearly. Even if it's written in the will, there's still fights. And many times they have complaints to the father and mother. You know, why did you do this and why did you do that? You love that son more. There's always fights. Many times there are fights amongst the brothers and sisters about the Yerusha. And what he's saying here, it's just better to have a simple life, get whatever you get, and go on with your life. Then pick on each other and, 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 and fight and fight forever. And some brothers and sisters don't talk to each other just because of money. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. It's a familiar scene. It's not something rare. It happens too often. And that, that's what leads to the next pasuk. The connection to the next pasuk is as follows. An intelligent slave will rule over a disgraceful son. And among the brothers he will divide inheritance. Sometimes the slave will inherit everything. Who is he talking about over here? Who eventually inherits the inheritance when all the brothers fight? The lawyers. So I call the Evet Maskil, the intelligent slave, the lawyer. He's now a part of the family. And he's making $350 an hour because they're fighting. You know how much money they can save if they wouldn't uh, have to hire the lawyers? So in the end, this Evet Maskil, a slave, ends up taking a good portion of the money just because of the merivot, just because of the fights. In this pasuk, Evet Maskil, Imshol Beven Nevish, an intelligent servant or intelligent slave could rule over a disgraceful son. The rabbis tell us, the commentaries explain, Merumaspo, what is insinuated here is the whole idea behind Yehos. Yehos means in English a lineage. A lot of people say, my father was a rabbi, my grandfather was a big rabbi. Yeah, but who cares? What about, who are you? What are you? What have you made of yourself? As the rabbis, as it's, it's brought down, to a story with Rabbi Preda. Rabbi Preda was told, prepare yourself, there's a very important guest coming. Who is this guest? Uh, he's the grandson of this great grand rabbi, and he's ten generations from Mizra Sofer. So Rabbi Preda says, I'm not impressed. If he himself is a learned man, and he has a very special lineage, that's great. If he's a learned man and he has no lineage, that's also good. But if he's not a learned man and he just has this special Yehoz lineage, let the fire consume him. That's how he expressed himself. In other words, I don't care to see him. So what's the big deal? A person says, I had a great father as a rabbi, grandfather, if he himself did not make of himself something like that. Yehoz, the real importance of Yehoz is, is only when a person follows in the ways and the footsteps of his fathers and emulates their ways. Then he can claim, you know what, my father was like that, my grandfather was like that. Otherwise, it's Eved Maskil Yimshol Beven Nevish. Beven, you know, with the Ben Nevish over here is a disgraceful son. The one who, who is completely different than his parents and grandparents. The real Yehus has only value when the individual himself partakes of it. And he emulates the, the ways of his parents and his grandparents. Next pasuk. Here he translates, a refining pot is for silver and a furnace is for gold, but Hashem tests the hearts. What that means is that there is different tools and vessels to refine gold and silver. And when you refine these metals, what do you do? You take out the sigim, all the impurities, to get pure gold and pure silver. That's done for, for gold and silver, special tools, machines to refine them. But he says over here, but when it comes to the hearts, HaKadosh Baruch Hu only knows what's going on in a person's heart. Only he knows how much solid there is, how much sigim, how much impurities. Another human being cannot refine it, cannot examine it, not with any extra machine, what's going on in a person's real heart, not the physical heart. Only Hashem knows. Why does he mention this to us? Because here he's pointing out the danger of tzvoim, of the hypocrite. We may not be able to tell sometimes. We see a person conducting himself in a certain way. He has a very long beard. He prays long time. He makes an impression that he's very observant. But he's totally not honest. In other words, and we would never know just by looking at him. And there are many stories of people who trusted these people and they eventually regretted it. They were thieves. Svoim they're called. So he's letting us know of the danger of these Svoim. And he's letting know that Svoim themselves, hey, don't think nobody knows, maybe perhaps nobody knows about you, but Hashem examines the heart. He knows what's going on in your heart. Rabbis tell us, especially this is true with those who create a tremendous Chilul Hashem. As the Pasuk says, Hashem 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 
do not uh, express uh, the name of Hashem in vain. Who are we talking about? We're talking about a person who puts on tefillin every day, but steals from people. A person that wears a tzitzit, aval merameh tabriyot. He cheats people. He misleads people. In other words, he's, he's like using Hashem's name in vain. It's a hilul Hashem when they find out the truth of what he did. You can't, you can't play a game like that. Hashem knows. Hashem is aware. He examines their hearts. This pasuk also has another meaning. The words here, Matzrep Lakesef Echur Zahav, the refining of gold and silver, is used to describe the time of Mashiach, also. During the time of Mashiach, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will, will refine the Jewish people. And there is a very shocking prophecy that I think hopefully is behind us. Hashem says one third of the Jewish nation will be refined and will suffer. Well, during the Holocaust, we lost one third. There were 18 million Jews before the Holocaust. Six million perished. So he will take one third, it says, and he will take from the best, and he will refine them. What does it mean to refine them? The rabbis tell us that when one receives Yesurim, when one undergoes pain and suffering, that's a refinement that cleanses him. So right before Mashiach comes, Kadosh Baruch Hu wants to remove a lot of debt that has accumulated in the Jewish nation, a lot of avonot, a lot of hataim over the years. So he refines it, he refines them by removing all the debt, by bringing about Yisurim, unfortunately. This Yisurim, of course, could be avoided if Am Yisrael would do Teshuvah, if Am Yisrael would conduct themselves properly. Otherwise, Hashem performs an operation. The operation is very painful, but it's for the good of the patient, otherwise he would die. It's like the example of the, of the foot that is suffering from gangrene. You know what gangrene is? When a leg or a foot is very sick, they don't cut it, the gangrene will spread to the whole body. That's what an operation is for. It's to save the person's life. When Hashem performs an operation on the Jewish nation, it's painful, but it's to save our life. Yes? If you, if God inflicts someone who's suffering and there's a civilization from God, is that still considered refinement? If he does what? If the person who's being inflicted yes. goes further away from God, is that still considered refinement? Yes, still, he, he still receives a refinement, but that refinement is not as beneficial to him. The rabbi tells me, whoever, whoever kicks, in other words, whoever rebels against the pain, goes against it, does not accept them, out of love, then not only does he not get as much credit for it, but they double it on him until he gets the message. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that later and how that comes about. So it does help him initially, but it depends on his attitude. All right, uh, another idea over here is, uh, as far as testing and challenging, when we say Hashem examines one's heart, or He, he challenges one, tests him to see what, how he's going to react, He doesn't do it for, for him to know. Hashem knows what's going on in our heart. When He tests someone, He challenges someone, it's for others to see. And it's for the individual to see on what level he is. A person is tempted by a certain situation, he's tempted and he held himself back, then he knows how strong he is. If he succumbed and he failed, then he himself knows where he's holding. So in the end, the test, the challenges are for others to observe or for the individual himself to see where he's holding. Hashem really knows. It's clear to him where we're all holding. He doesn't really need to examine to find out. It's the examination that's necessary for others to see, for others to learn from, and for the individual himself to see where he's holding. Next pasuk, Mira makshiv al sefat aven sheker mezin al shon havot. Actually, before we go to that pasuk, there is another gemara that says that all the mitzvot were given to us letzaref bahim at Israel. The mitzvot that were given to us, what they are for is letzaref to purify us. But when when a Jew performs a mitzvah, Hashem doesn't need our mitzvot. He doesn't need anything. You know, He needs our animals, when we brought sacrifices, He doesn't eat. All the mitzvot that we did with our feet and with our hand and with our mouth was to refine us. It does something to our character. Imagine somebody giving tzedakah daily. It does something to himself. It hopefully takes a selfish nature and, and turns him into a giver instead of a taker. All the mitzvot are letzaref. They're intended, the main goal is not only to fix this world, not only to bring about the rule of Hashem in this world, but it's, 
It's for our own personal benefit. We gain from it. The Pasuk Dalit is Mera Makshiv Al Sifat Avin Sheker Mezin Al Avot. Here he translates it, an evildoer, Mera. He hearkens to a language of violence. A liar lends an ear to destructive language. I'm going to translate it, I'm going to simplify it a little bit. Mera, an evildoer, a person who has evil ideas, evil thoughts. He wants to harm others. He's, he, he couldn't care less about others. This is a person who's a Mera. He, because of his nature, Makshiv al Sfat Avin, he readily hears gossip, evil talk. He readily hears it because he's interested in that kind of a talk. And he doesn't care that it's Lashonara. He doesn't even know what Lashonara is. He's very unsensitive about these things because that's what he likes to do. As Yeshlo Ozen Kashevet, as we say in Hebrew, he, he's looking for these things. He will, he, will, he will be willing to receive, to accept Lashonara very easily. Why? Because when it comes to finding defects in human beings, that's, it's almost like his profession. In other words, he, will, he, he does that on his own. So when he hears something that's not right, something that's negative about someone else, instead of going over to the individual and asking him, by the way, did you look into it? Did you investigate it? You know it's the Shonara, you know it's not right, it's not proper. Perhaps you shouldn't talk about him like that. You're going to hurt his reputation. He's a mira. he's an evildoer. There are individuals out there, unfortunately, who have this nature, who therefore, you have to be careful what you say in front of them, because that's all they need to hear, and they will spread it all over town. That's the mira. And then you have the man who's called Sheker Mezin al Havot. A liar lends an ear to destructive language. So you have a liar and you have an, an evil, an evildoer. A liar, because he's a liar, when he hears this Lashon Hara, Gamke lo mafchin, he doesn't try to figure out what's true and what's false, what's exaggeration and what's not, if it's just a rumor or if it's a fact. Because he's a liar, that's his nature, so therefore, Mezin al Havot. Mezin over here is like Mazin. He's willing to listen to anything. He's willing to accept it. Do you actually believe everything you hear in the radio? No. You know why you shouldn't? Because a lot of time, a lot of these journalists or these people on the radio, they have an agenda. They're biased. They may write something or say something in a particular way that is wrong. So don't believe everything you hear exactly the way it's being said. But one who's a liar, one is an evildoer because he's not concerned because he doesn't care about other people's sensitivities, he, he lies, that's his nature, then he's willing to accept anything. One has to, of course, be careful in dealing with such individuals. There are people like that. The next pasuk, He who mocks a poor man, mock meaning making fun. He blasphemes his, his maker. He who rejoices at a misfortune will not go unpunished. There's two parts to this pasuk. One who makes fun of a poor man, mocks him. What he's really doing is mocking his creator. What, why is he mocking a poor man? He's saying, you know, what, this poor, you know why he's poor? He doesn't have brains. He didn't use his brains. And that's why he's not making any money. Instead of saying, that's his mazal perhaps, he's, he's going against the Kadosh Baruch Hu. He's trying to explain... That the whole idea of why this poor man is a poor man is because of his own undoing, because of his own problems. And in the end, in reality, it's a cheshbon milemala from Shemayim. So it's a, it's, a for, it's a form of disrespect to HaKadosh Baruch Hu when we try to explain somebody's personal situation in our own way. And the second part of the pasuk is Sameh le'ed lo inakeo. There are some people who are very happy when people trip. Somebody went bankrupt somebody's house burnt down. There are some people who are really happy about it. That's called Sameach Le'ed. It's a terrible midah. To be happy in the misfortune of someone else, very, very not nice. And therefore, because this is such a terrible midah, on this one, Shalom Amr says, Lo'in nake. You know what Lo'in nake means? He will not go clean. Whenever it says he will not go clean, it means Ba'ulam Azeh. Not Ba'ulam Abba. Even in Ulam Azeh, he's going to get it. He's going to get it. Because he's so confident of himself that it's not going to happen to him. It just happens to someone else. Shem says, because that's, that's the attitude here. It happened to him. It didn't happen to me. It's going to happen to you. And if, and if, and if we're talking about, about a, a poor man, then this man, the commentaries explain, Midah Kenegi Midah, his punishment will be that one of these days he's going to have to beg as well. So, Sameh Laed Loi He will not go clean. 
one has to be very careful the commentaries also say for making fun of any poor man who be- behaves in a very unusual way the rabbis tell us the poor people can behave in an unusual way means because of the poverty the pressures of poverty makes them sometimes do things or say things that they would ordinarily not say so we have to judge them favorably we have to be careful it's just like somebody who under pressure did something terrible but he was under pressure he would never have done it otherwise so when one sees a poor man acting in a certain way be careful how we judge him as the rabbis tell us in different words don't judge someone achata until you put yourself in his shoes you don't know what you would do we don't know so therefore we have to be extra sensitive if we see someone acting not nicely it could be because of the pressures of the poverty that he's in this pasuk loeg larash rabbis tell us is also talking about one who sees a funeral going in the street a jewish funeral and does not accompany the niftar as loeg larash the poor man is like a rash he's like he's the, the the dead person is like a poor man he has no no more chances of doing mitzvot so he's called a poor man and here this man who's seeing this funeral is not going to give this man his last respects that's called loeg larash rabbis tell us you have to be very careful with that it's a terrible abon and on the contrary whoever is careful with accompanying those who have recently passed away in that merit he, he, he will also have a funeral where people will come and give their last respects besides the reward for the mitzvah Hashem will make sure that he is taken care of that people will come and attend his funeral because he was careful with, with others yeah yeah that's, that's what it has to do with I, uh, I'd like to just include here in this pasuk the story, famous story of Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar was going home and in the middle of the way he sees an individual who apparently was not very good looking and he goes over to him and he says how ugly you are tell me, are all the people of your town just as ugly as you? We, you know, we are not here to judge great tzaddikim we don't understand what was going on in his mind but it did show a little bit of a lack of sensitivity how do you think the man responded? go complain to my maker that he made such an ugly vessel go ask him as soon as he said that he heard he, he felt very bad he says he realized he made a mistake he says I'm sorry please forgive me no I'm not forgiving you and he <laughs> went after him for several miles until he finally reached the city his hometown and everybody came out to greet the rabbi and uh, the man asked, who are you greeting here, giving so much respect to, to, to the rabbi? He says, he's your rabbi? May there not be many like him in Israel. And it was a curse. What did he do to you? And he told him what he did. Forgive him. I'm only going to forgive him if he promises he, never, he would never do this again to anybody. And of course, he promised that he would never do it again. But that was not enough. He went into the Bet Midrash and gave a special lecture about what just happened. A person should always get used to being as soft like a cane, like a reed, you know, that grows in the swamps, a reed. A reed is very soft. The zakha, the reed has the zakhut that they take from it to make a kolmos for the sofer, to write sifre Torah. What do they do with the erez? The erez is very strong, the cedar. But a big strong wind knocks it down, and once it's knocked down, what do they do? They chop it up. They make they make, take logs for it to build homes and for the fireplace. Be soft, don't be harsh, be easygoing. Otherwise, in other words, the next pasuk we've seen similar before. Ateret zekenim benevanim v'tiferet banim avotam. Children's children are the crown of the age, and the glory of the children is their fathers. What we have here is uh, a situation where the parents are proud of their kids, and the kids are proud of their parents. As we've explained in the past, the ultimate nachat that every Jewish parent wants to have, nachat means satisfaction and happiness combined together. It's called nachat. You rest, you're at peace. In Israel, there's an expression called ayelet sheli mesudar. Ayelet sheli mesudar in Hebrew means my child is taken care of. If you ask Israelis, what does it mean a child is taken care of? Well, mesudar, he has a Volvo and a villa. <laughs> Mesudar, in other words, I took care of him. He has his Volvo and he has his villa. And maybe his yacht also, his yacht. That's called Mesudar. 
What does he say? That's not called Mesudar. Sidru Oto Ulai, but not Mesudar, as we say in Israeli Hebrew slang, Sidru Oto. In other words, that he's, 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 he's lost in his uh, materialism. But the real Mesudar is called when the grandparents are able to point to their children in two generations. Look, they're the same as us. They're just as observant, if not any better. That brings, t- that brings tiferet, that brings beauty to the family as a whole. That's the real nahat, that's the real mesudar, when the children are good. And this is while they're alive, and also after they depart from this world. It brings tremendous happiness and satisfaction to those neshamot, who are able to still uh, see or know, they're aware of what's going down in this world. That their children or grandchildren either are doing the right thing or not. So he reminds us that this is the ultimate nacha, this is what we should strive for. This is what brings ultimate glory or beauty to the family. And as the rabbis tell us in different words, if one sees three generations of Torah in a family, where the grandfather was a rabbi, the son, and the grandson, three straight generations, the Torah will always be in that family. Even if it skips one, it could skip one. The fourth generation, the boy decided he wants to be a businessman. All right. He could pray in the morning, put on tefillin, tzitzit, eat kosher, keep Shabbat, and be a businessman. And learn at night for half an hour every day, him. That's fine. But the Torah has to mechazeret al shela. The Torah will eventually come back to its achsanya, to, I guess, achsanya in English, to its... Uh, to the storage. No, 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 not in storage. To, to the inn. Achsanya is what the inn, where it rested, where it stopped to rest. You know, like a hotel? The Torah will come back into the van. So it could be that that businessman's son will become a big rabbi or Rosh Hashiva. Since you had three generations straight of Torah, the Torah will come back in that family. That is the true ateret iferet of the family, that the Torah is there. I've been approached many times by Goim. You know, they ask me, you know, so what religion are you? I'm Jewish. How long have you ever been? Have you always been Jewish? I said, yes, for over 3,000 years. The same thing. And as soon as I say that, they're, you know, what? Yeah. You know, we didn't start in Ireland, and we didn't come with the Mayflower. You know, we go back a long time. <laughs> Longer than the Chinese. So, yeah, nothing. No interruptions. Straight. And some families, including ours, more or less, we can even go all the way back. Many generations back. And point out who was the father, the grandfather, great-grandfather. You know, either it's written down, or we have it by tradition where we come from, from which Shevet, from which person, all the way. You, you know, some people are able to keep track, some people have lost track. All the way to Yaakov Avinu. Next, Vasuk, Lo naval le naval sefat yeter af kilinadiv sefat shaker. Proud words do not defeat a vile person. And surely not lying speech to a generous one. So we have two individuals here, one who is vile, one who is naval. Not a good person. And one who is nadiv, one who is generous. Two opposite people. So he says like this, just like to the vile person, to the one who's not generous, who's not nice, who's not kind, he's a naval. Just like for him, it not, does not befit him to speak about his, his, his good th- character, because he doesn't have any. Because if he behaves himself in such a way, he cannot take credit for anything. I mean, it's a contradiction. It's zelomat it's im. It does not befit for a naval Sfat yeter, to talk highly of himself, of some accomplishment, of something that he did that's nice. Because he's a naval. It doesn't befit him. Zlomat imlo. In the same way that to a naval, you can't say good things about him. In the same way, a person who's generous has to be careful not to lie. It does not, it does not fit. One who's generous, one who's generous, maftiah mekayem. Maftiah means he promises and he keeps his promises. If, he's, if he does not keep his promise, a person who promises and does not deliver, that's sheker. That sheker lo matim to the character of a nadiv, of a generous man. So, sheker is not good for anybody. But for somebody who is ordinarily a generous man, a kind-hearted person, he has to be extra careful that when he makes a promise, he keeps it. Because the lo matim lo. Just like the lo matim, for the, it's not, does not befit the, the evil man to talk about the good things that he does. It does just go together in the same way one who's in a div has to be careful not even say the smallest lie even indirect lie yeah, yeah that's right 
Next pasuk, Eben hen ha-shochad ve'ine be'alav el kol asher yifnei askil. A bribe is a precious stone in the eyes of the one who has it. Wherever he turns, he prospers. Okay, that's the loosely translated, but the, the, the meaning of this pasuk is as follows. Bribery, as you know, is, is very misleading. The Torah tells us in very clear black and white words. Bribery can blind the eyes of the sages and of the righteous, not just of ordinary people. The more so, but it can even blind the eyes of the righteous people. So it says over here, you know how dangerous bribery is? It's even hen. It's like a precious stone. You'll like it. If you get used to it, it will be a beautiful precious stone that you will admire, you will enjoy. And as a result of that, in any case that you may have, that you are the judge, you will find ways, in other words, to try to uh, find a guy innocent, try to find a way to defend the individual, try to find a, a way for him to win. And all of that because of the shohad. person who gets used to accepting bribery, then that bribery becomes easy for him to take. Because it's like an even hen, it's like a precious stone. It's beautiful in his eyes. He can't get rid of it. And he's not embarrassed of it. There's a story with Rabbi Ishmael in the Gemara. Rabbi Ishmael had an aris. An aris, an aris in English, it's like a lease. Somebody, in the, they used to have different kinds of leases in the time of Gemara. One lease is you pay money and you have a place to, for use. Another kind of lease is that you work the fields and instead of paying cash, you pay with the produce. With the produce, you pay the landlord, here, I just planted and cultivated a hundred tons of potatoes. You get three tons of it, right, or whatever. But, yeah. That's called aris, arisut. There's different kinds. Mishkanta? Huh? Is there a kind? One kind is mishkanta? It's called mishkanta? No, no, no. Arisut. There's different kinds of arisut. You know, uh, with the money, with the produce. So this, uh, the aris always used to bring some fruit to Rabbi Ishmael on Fridays. Every Friday before Shabbat, he used to bring some fruit. One time, he came a day early, Thursday. So Rabbi Ishmael asked him, why did you come today? Why did you come a day early? He says, because I have a Din Torah later, so I wanted to bring it to you before. He says, since you said to me that you have a Din Torah, I have to disqualify myself from the case, and I'm going to have to bring you other judges. Because right now he's bringing him the fruit before the Din Torah. I have to disqualify myself. Anyway, so they went to Din Torah. Rabbi Ishmael was in the court watching. And as he was watching the case, he was praying for the guy to win. I wish he says this, I wish he'll say that to defend himself. And as he's thinking that he, hey, wait a minute, he says, I'm favoring this guy. If I can favor this guy, could you imagine other people, what they would do? And that, you know, and he was not even the judge, he was already favoring him because of that small little, what appeared to be like a bribe. That's how dangerous a bribe is. Very, very dangerous. You have to be very careful. Not, it's, it's, it's a sur to accept bribe or to give a bribe. The rabbis tell us in this pasuk, even hena shochad, that the shochad is like a stone. When a, sto a rock falls, it breaks. It breaks something, right? And it, breaks, it could break something which was otherwise good. Where do we see that in this week's parasha? Esav and Yitzhak. Yitzhak loved Esav. Why? Kitzayid befiv. Because he used to give him to eat. He used to take care of his him. So he liked him, especially because of that. And of course, it's his son. But he had a certain liking towards him because of the food, because of the way he was treated. And that, of course, blinded him from seeing the true behavior of his son. That he was a rasha. He would never believe it. You know how some parents are totally blind? My son, my darling son, should do that? I don't believe you. <laughs> Yeah, your darling son is a, is a hevra man, as we say, you know, he's a... <laughs> yeah. What constitutes a bribe? What if you want to invite someone over for, to your house for dinner? Yeah. I mean, is that necessarily a Shabbat meal? I mean, the person, you may have some potential business relationship with him, but you invite him over. Is that, is he indebted to you because you invited him over? 
Is he indebted to you? Well, I mean, you, it's, you know, what it's, do you it's mean? fruit, like you talked about the fruit with, the, with Rabbi That's Yishu. not a bribe. That's, you're not judging him. That's just, uh, you know, you want to have a good relationship with him. You want to borrow money from him, <laughs> right? That's okay to do, you know, as long as you plan to repay him. You know, you're not just getting him ensnared by inviting him and showing how, you know, you know, people have gone bankrupt. They knew they were going bankrupt and they went and borrowed money. They knew they were already going bankrupt just to take away. Mm-hmm. That's totally not fair. So if you're Kavanot or Lashem Shemaim, you know, you just want to, you want to, you want to be, pl- you want to have a pleasant relationship with him. That's fine. But you, but you can't be, you can't be completely neutral, Rabbi. If you were, uh, you used to work in the appraiser's office. Yeah. So client or somebody you were appraising, and it was a Jewish fellow. He invited you to his home. Well, so, well, that's what they told us. They told us it's against the policy to accept gifts over ten dollars. I think it was. <laughs> but is a dinner considered gift to invite you out? Yeah, lunch also. I think that, I don't recall. Lunch, I think, was not was not always appropriate. It's a conflict of interest. You know, it's a problem. It could be a problem. See. Nevertheless, sometimes they would allow for it, but they would tell you to just be careful. You know at least let your supervisor know so at least he would review your work you didn't, you didn't give the guy a discount because of that <laughs> you know but you're right these things can happen very easily sure. and some people try it out somebody I think offered me once why don't you come for the barbecue tonight the kosher barbecue uh, yeah yeah <laughs> yeah sure it's, it, but that's what it is that's a fact Shohad. now we've come to a very important pasuk about friendships relationships mechaseh <laughs> pesha he who conceals transgression seeks love, but he who harps on the matter alienates Hashem or alienates his friend. Aluf could either mean one's spouse, one's friend, or it could mean Hashem over here. Very, very significant pasuk. What's mechase pesha? People make mistakes, people yell, people criticize, people do things. And it happens. You know, hopefully we regret it, hopefully we ask forgiveness. And it's over. But many people don't forget. Even my wife reminds me, remember what you did 20 years ago? I said, but it was 20 years ago. Yeah. But I, I hear that it's, it's true with many women. They just they have a long memory you know, of good things too. Okay? A long memory, but why are you bringing it up right now? I don't know. I don't understand sometimes why it's brought up at certain times. But they remember, they don't forget. So he tells us over here, you have to be careful with that. You have to be careful with harping. I like the word harping. Good translation. You want to you have a loving relationship with your spouse, with your friends. You want to be in good terms. Every transgression, every wrong that was done, mistake or intentionally, just ignore it. Forget it. Cover it up. Don't harp on it. Don't bring it up again. Once, of course, you've, you've talked it out. You've talked about it and it's gone. Forget it. Don't bring it up again. Whoever covers up, whoever does not focus on the negative traits of everyone, he is seeking a loving relationship. He is seeking to have friends. One who will always harp, he repeats and talks about it all the time, that he's he's going to lose all his friends, all the aluf, all the alufim, all the close people. Aluf is that which is close to you, that, that was important to you. Mafrid, you're separating, you're causing more and more problems, the friction is still there. You are alienating, alienating, alienating him. Yeah, that's what happens when you, when you harp on something. It creates distance. People don't realize that. That after 12 years of alienating each other, they go to marriage counselor. He's not going to help them. They've lost their love and affection too for much, each other. Too much bitterness. Too much bitterness. It's still possible to come back, by the way, but it's very hard. So therefore, you wanna you wanna stay together, friends or husband and wife. You want to be mevakesh You have to be mechaseh. You have to be willing to forgo, forgive. Yes. Exactly. The rabbi, actually, the commentaries tell us that that if you don't, you're 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 transgressing lotitor, not bearing a, dr- a grudge. Yeah. Or well, well, whatever. Yeah, maybe maybe every 24 hours. Yeah. <laughs> Every 24 hours, it's supposed to be possible. Yeah. Rabbi, people who are Rishayim, we, 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 we cannot forgive or forget what they did to us, Rabbi. That's Even something else. That we, we're not seeking their love and their relationship. Oh. <laughs> He's advising us here. You want, you want to have friends? 
then you have to be mechase. You have to be ma'avir al amidot. You have to be willing to 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 give in. Otherwise, at amafrida luf, you lose. Nobody will want to be your friend if you're harping and you always point out his faults. Husband has many times chances to point out a certain fault in his wife. Does he, do you really want to do that? You know what you're going to do? Think about it. You know what you're going to do by pointing out a fault? You're going to alienate her. You see the same thing? Though? I have to be fair to men and women. You're going to alienate him, the women. If you point out a fault, point it out once, talk about it in a nice, indirect way. Perhaps we can, you know, get some help for this. And that's it. No, I remember you didn't do this. No, I didn't do that right. What for? And your mother did this and this. Oh, no, that's even worse now. The mother's in the picture now, too. Yeah, sure. And you, you, know, what, you know what that leads to? Oh, and I remember your mother, too. She did, you know, remember? You know, she didn't pay for this, and they, and they bought me this, and your parents didn't buy me that. And then, uh, oh, you know how it goes. It escalates, yeah. Yeah, it escalates. You were mevakesha hava. You want to have a loving relationship? You have to be mechaseh. You have to forgive. You have to forget. And, uh, and, if, if, and if anybody, by the way, tells you, you did this and you did that, you're right. Okay. I'm sorry. All right. Instead of getting into an argument, no, you didn't understand it. Sometimes it doesn't pay to argue. It all depends on the individual, what sign they are. You know, astrologically, sometimes you don't win any arguments with them. And you also don't win if you keep quiet. Because they're going to ask you, why are you quiet? <laughs> Why are you quiet? Say something. <laughs> so it's very, very hard to win. So what do I do? I change subjects. But my wife is smart. She says, Why are you changing the subject? <laughs> yeah, anyway. But, so what do I say? What do you care? Why am I changing the subject? <laughs> yeah, let's change the subject. By Baruch Hashem, I've been very successful when I change the subject. It really works. It, it, it's, you know, it, it just, you, 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 you just move on. You move on, you know. So for the first few seconds, they're going to ask, why are you changing the subject? But after a while, they forgot that they said, why are you changing the subject? So it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Person who is a kapdan, kapdan means he's strict, demanding, wise and dinner ready. Again, beans, again this, again that. There were some rabbis, you know, who were married to women who were not such good cooks. But they swallowed and they accepted and secretly and quietly they made themselves something else later and uh, as long as you do it secretly you know you, you don't want to insult you know her feelings uh, then it's okay but to bring it up what are you going to accomplish you know there's a lot of ways to, to, to say it or to communicate it by the way I bought you for your birthday a, a book about cooking <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe you know you have to you have to be smart, you know how to do it. Yeah. Don't take her to your mother to her for her to learn, right? From your mother. No, that's not I don't think that's such a good idea. No, see it, it, it takes a lot of intelligence to be able to handle these situations. But the bottom line here the, the, what the Pasuk is really saying is you want to succeed in any relationship, you have to be willing to forgive and forgo. Cover it up. Otherwise what you're asking is for Mafrida Luf to lose the friendship, to create distance, to alienate the other. Next pasuk, Tahat ge'ara b'mevin me'akot kesil me'a. Here he translates it that the humility caused by the rebuke of an understanding person is more effective than a hundred blows to a fool. All right, I will translate it like this: Tahat ge'ara b'mevin. When you, when a, a mevin, an individual who has understanding, who's willing to listen, he receives a ge'ara, he receives a rebuke. That's all that he needs. It's effective for him. He's a mevin. That's much more powerful than mehakot ksil mea than if you give a hundred makot to ksil. Ksil, even if you give him over his head a hundred times, he won't listen. He won't change. A person who's a mevin, all he needs is a rebuke. Sometimes you don't have to hit a child. Sometimes you don't have to hit. Sometimes you can give a gyara. And if he has some havana, he will understand. A person who's a ksil, even if you hit him over his head, it won't help. Now, Rabbi Yonatan Aibshid says something beautiful in the Sefer Yarod Vash, in the Drashot. He says like this, if somebody has a good friend, two good friends, the Musar of a good friend is much more powerful than a, a thousand speeches of the Rabbi. A person can come to shul, can come to class and hear it a thousand times. It will not be as effective if a friend tells it to him. Because he knows, oh, this friend is on my side. He means my, 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 my benefit, my good. 
So therefore, the, if you have any influence over anybody, you have to take advantage of it. Over your children, if you have a good relationship with them, hopefully you do, is to tell them in a nice way, because that will be more effective than if a teacher tells it to them. Now, there are some teachers who have formed beautiful relationships with students, and, they, and the student can point to us 35 years later, I remember that teacher. He was nice to me. He said this and this to me. And they remember the ones that hit him over their head too. That teacher I didn't like. He always used to pull my ear. Yeah, there are teachers, there were teachers like that. Today they're more careful. So a, a good friend, a good friend can have a tremendous amount of influence on, 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 uh, on his friend, much more than the rabbi. So therefore he should take advantage of it. Next pasuk, Achmeri yevakesh ra umalach achzari yishulach bo. He who is uh, only rebellious seeks evil, and a cruel angel shall be sent against him. What that, what that means is a person who is a meri, he is rebellious. A person who is rebellious, and it has to do with the previous pasuk, what can you do? What is Hashem going to do with someone who is rebellious? He has to send him a malach achzari, a cruel angel. A cruel angel means some sort of punishment. Maybe that's the only way he will, he will understand that he's doing something wrong. Therefore, the rabbis tell us, that the way Hashem begins is not with the Malach. If somebody is misbehaving himself, a Baruch Hu usually sends something after his finances. That's the Kapara, that's the first sign, first signal. If he got the message, good, that's where it stops. Didn't get the message, it goes after his goof. He becomes sick. Doesn't help, then Hazrat Shalom at the very end, the worst possible thing is he goes after the nefesh, he takes his soul. Hashem never goes after the goof or the neshama or the nefesh before he goes after his finances. Finances is step number one. A lot of people come to me, Rabbi, I have an evil eye, an aynara, or a kishuf, somebody caused some witchcraft. The parnasah is struggling. I say, why are you blaming the witchcraft or the aynara? Maybe you're not keeping Shabbat properly. Maybe you're fighting with your wife too. You know, if a person fights with his wife and she cries, he is affecting the parnasah of his house. He's affecting the beracha of his house. So people are blaming everything except for themselves. First examine your own deeds, what's going on in your home, before you try to blame somebody Ainara on you. Yes? The last part, you said if the people, if the person fights with his wife, right. and she's crying, it could, it could, ruin, it could ruin his parnasa. Really? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Pagosh dov shakul be'ish v'al k'sil bi'valto, May a bereaving bear encounter a person rather than a fool with his folly. Dov shakul, a bereaving bear, a bear that just lost one of his pups. Pups? Cubs. Huh? Cubs? So what's a pup? For a dog. For a dog, or whatever. Lost one of his little cubs. He's very, very mad. You're better off meeting up with such a, a dove, with such a bear. Dangerous, but not as dangerous as a, a nevil. A nevil, a fool that is out there to mislead you. La situ la diach. Because the dove may hurt one ba'olam mazeh. In Mesitu Mediach, one who misleads a Jew is misleading him from olam ba. In the world to come, that is even more dangerous. So that one has to be careful a lot more with such an individual. Let's see if we have time for one, one more pasuk here. Meshiv ra'ah lo tamush ra'ah mi beto. He who repays evil for good, Evil will not depart from his house. This is the midah of kfiyutova. Kfiyutova means being ungrateful. It's a terrible midah. Then there's something even worse called meshalem ra'ah tahatova. Doing bad or harming one for, and he has done something good to you. Instead of repaying him the good, you, we do halila something bad to him. That's even worse than just being ungrateful and not acknowledging or recognizing it. A terrible midah. And uh, there was a story in the Gemara, I think in the Gemara, that of Rabbi Abba, who once saw an individual coming from far away, taking a nap, a snake coming to bite him, and all of a sudden, before the snake bit him, a rock fell down and killed the snake. After he got up from his place, a big landslide came down exactly where he was sitting. Two miracles. Rabbi Abba says, tell me, Mama Secha, you must be a tzaddik, what do you do a whole day that you had two miracles? I don't do too much, he says, but I forgive everyone. Whoever did anything against me, I always forgive everybody. And even if something, somebody did something against me, I always try to do good with them. He did bad, and I try to do good to them. This individual, Zachaf Tutunisim, instead of being Kafuitovan and Afuch, 
He looks for ways to help people. Another, another interpretation of this pasuk is what Rabbi Meir did. Rabbi Meir once made peace between two neighbors. After that he heard the Satan saying, I just got kicked out of this house. Because as long as they were fighting, I was in living in that house. But now that peace is, is reigning in the homes, I got kicked out. That's the meaning of this pasuk. A person who is ungrateful, he will always have it bad. One who has ra'a in the house is also, will not, will not be able to bring in the good into the house. In other words, one is causing with his own actions to bring about the ra'a. By, leaving, by, by allowing it to stay. Rabbi Meir therefore, by making peace between the neighbors, he was able to bring tova, and he was therefore able to drive out the ra'a. He was able to drive out the satan. Why is a person kafui tova? The word kafui could either mean to cover up, he ignores that something good was done to him, or it could be kofe, zemagiali, it's coming to me. And that is why he's ungrateful if he thinks it's coming to me. Therefore, I always tell people, in order to be careful from this midah for you to a person should always remember, shum davar lo magielano, nothing is coming to us. Sometimes, if we get something, then we should be thankful and grateful to it. One should never have an attitude, the magiel is coming to me. Nothing, no magia. If a Kadosh Baruch wishes it, if he blesses us, then we, should, then we will receive it, and we will be thankful, we will be grateful, and we will acknowledge it. When a child is born, we make a seuda. A lot of people, if a girl is born, no seuda, that's it, it's a girl. She's healthy, be thankful. Say thank you to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You leave the bathroom, say Asher Yatsar. Don't take anything for granted. There's a lot of people who can't go easily to the bathroom. They're in, they're, they're, they have diapers. I'm talking about older people. So be, we have to be thankful for everything. A person that gets used to thanking HaKadosh Baruch Hu, not taking anything for granted, not having the attitude that it's coming to him, it will help him stay away from this terrible midat called Fiyutova, being ungrateful. A Jew has to be continuously grateful that Kadosh Baruch Hu has restored him his, his neshama every morning. That is why we say, Modea ni lefanecha, melechave kayam, shechzarta bin nishmati bechemla, rabai munatecha.